Hello. Today is June 23rd, 2010. We're meeting today with Mr. Thomas Phelan at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Tom, and thanks for sitting down to, to tell your story today. Thank you. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, I am a native of Colorado. I was born in Denver in 1923. I grew up there, went to college there, and then moved to uh, St. Louis for graduate work, and then got a job as a professor of philosophy at St. Norbert College in Green Bay, Wisconsin, just out of Green Bay, uh, Wisconsin, where I served for, I stayed in Wisconsin for about 50 years. And in later years, I was Wisconsin winter and New Mexico summers. And just about uh, eight years ago, seven years ago now, we moved up to Fort Collins because my daughter lives here. And I have a daughter and a son in Fort Collins, two of five children. And the others are in, uh, one in Wilmington, Delaware, another in Seattle, Washington, and another in Green Bay. All over the country. So they're all over, and that takes us all over. So yeah. we have done a lot of traveling over the years, but uh, we're at the point now where we just like to stay. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's back up then. So uh, growing up, uh, any brothers and si uh, sisters? I have uh, two brothers and two sisters. One sister has passed on. The other one lives in Portland. And the brothers, uh, one lives in Pueblo, Colorado, and the other in Denver. And how did you fit in that order? I was the oldest. You were the oldest. Okay. Okay, so you uh, <clears throat> went through the school system there in Denver, uh, 23, so you graduated in 41? I graduated in 42 from 42? Regis uh, College, oh, or Regis High School, Regis High School. Okay. and then I went on to Regis College. Uh, so you were uh, uh, then a senior when, when Pearl Harbor was bombed? Yes. And do you remember, uh, remember hearing about that and what you yes, were thinking? Yes, I did. It was a Sunday, I remember, we had come home from church and we were listening on the radio, could hardly believe what we heard. Of course, and just sat down, spellbound by the news coming over the radio. Any thoughts about? I mean, here you are, uh, eighteen, almost eighteen, almost ready to graduate from uh, from uh, from high school. Any thoughts? You know, I'm going to get pulled into this thing, or what were you thinking? In well, the... yes, of course, we we realized that this could be a, a long-lasting affair because we had yet to invade uh, Europe, not to mention uh, Japan. And so we knew that was going to be long, and uh, eventually all of us would be involved in it. And of course, everybody wanted to be part of it. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't a slacker in the, in the whole country. You know, they all wanted to be in, it was tough in high school when veterans, I'd go downtown, there would be veterans there, and they'd wonder where, why I wasn't in uniform. And I said, well, wait till I get out of school, and I'll be there. <laughs> so uh, it took some while before that happened. And, I, I, uh, I was aware of so certain programs that were offered by the military, and so I uh, finished high school, then entered college, and was able to get one year of college. It was in college that they came recruiting, and so there were recruiters coming in the, in the fall, and uh, most everyone signed up for one uh, branch or another, and. Uh, I waited for the Navy. I was partial to the Navy, as many inlanders were, because of the, of the romance. Okay, that's that's the always Navy. my question. Here's a, a, a boy from Landlock, Colorado. Yeah. How does he come to choose the Navy? Yeah. We had a lot of people from Midwest in you know, the Navy. Yeah. And I was always uh, amazed by that. But uh, there was a kind of romance to the Navy. We didn't know it. We knew soldiers pretty well. And I think. Uh, we were attracted to the unknown a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I remember I tried to get into the Navy Air, and uh, for some reason they said I had too much overbite. And I don't know what the problem was, but anyway, I went into uh, surface uh, training, would be first training. And they, it was called at the time the V1 mm -hmm. program. When we got on active duty, which was uh, the next July, it was, it was November when I enlisted. November of 40 42. Okay. Yes. And in July 1st, I went on active duty, and it was a, then became a B-12 program. 
<laughs> now, now, were you able? You were still you know, still able to stay at Regis and and, and do training with the V1? No, or I, I uh, no, uh, Regis did not have a program for military, so I was sent to Carroll College in Helena, Montana. And uh, in July 1st of 43, I spent a semester there, and I had listed myself as a law student. So they, after one semester, they sent me to the University of Washington in Seattle. And I spent two quarters there. And uh, <clears throat> after that, uh, that was enough college for me. They sent me to uh, uh, Asbury Park, New Jersey, for pre-midshipman school training. I was there about six weeks, right on the ocean front. We occupied old hotels that had been commandeered by the Navy. And uh, we just did uh, training mostly. And it was at that period that I gained, I realized I had gained weight. I graduated from high school at 129 and a half pounds, and I now was 165. What did what do you attribute that to? Was it well? It was the training in the Navy that did that. Oh, okay. Oh, so you did have some uh, some physical basic training along with your schooling. Oh yes. Okay. We did, and uh, we we had we had required strength tests. I think we took twice a year, and uh, as a measure, I suppose. And uh, I remember uh, doing things I never thought I could do. You know, one of them was sit-ups, and if you could hit a hundred three hundred and five sit-ups, you got. Uh, that was the tops, and I did it every time. Wow. 305 sips. I think I could barely do 10 now, but anyway. Um, so after six weeks there, we were sent to Columbia for midshipman training. I was the 21st class, and I lived in Fernald Hall, which is the same one that the guy from that famous, the King Mutiny lived in. I think it was the King Mutiny, yeah. The ensign there lived in Fernald Hall. And uh, of course, this was a fantastic experience from a kid from out uh, west who'd never seen further than the mountains. Well, I mean, uh, growing up in that generation, that time period, usually you didn't travel too far away from home. No, so no. here you were, bounced to the west coast, to the east coast, to the big cities, and New York City. I mean, it must have been very exciting. New York City and Times Square was really fabulous. And we had friends, we got to know people, and these women took us under their wing, they were in Greenwich Village, and uh, we used to go down there. And there was a famous place down in the Greenwich Village called Nick's, and it was a jazz place. And we went down there, and uh, boy, one night we had a great time, we had a beer or two. We were in the midshipman uniforms, and we came out to take the, uh, to take the subway home. We were cleared up on 114th Broadway, Columbia University, and uh, my friend and I said, will you get a dime? It would take us a nickel a piece on the subway. That was our cost. And I don't know if that was a military advantage or not, but anyway, a nickel a piece, neither of us had a penny. So we had to go back up, up to the top, up to the street, and find a midshipman in uniform and ask him for a dime so we could get back to school. And that's how we got back. I'll never forget that. Yeah. But uh, we, we visited a lot of things, saw a lot of things, although we were paid $5 a week. The rest of it went into escrow for uniforms and so forth on graduation. So we, we, didn't, we couldn't do very much on $5 a week. And we were off on, uh, after uh, parade, the, the parade was on Saturday morning, we'd be off Saturday afternoon until Sunday dinner time. So it wasn't very long. We had one night we could be, be in, in the uh, city in the evening. But uh, another, another thing I remember with great uh, fondness was our graduation. We had a, 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 they tried to make officers and gentlemen out of us, even in the short uh, period that we had midshipman training. And uh, the dance, the ball, that finished, finished up our semester there was on the Prairie State. The Prairie State was a battleship of, of uh, Teddy Roosevelt's time. Oh, wow. The great white fleet that sailed around the world. Well, this was a run the last of it, I suppose. It was stationed uh, upriver from the Washington Bridge, and that's where we had our, our final ball. 
the thing, of course, it had the old wood camber deck, you know, so that uh, you had to go uphill and downhill when you were dancing. But they put on, they, they put it on pretty good. They had the uh, the commodore was there and his his party, and we had we had a reception line and uh, so forth. So it was quite an affair. And then we graduated from there, and people were assigned. There were several of my dear friends who were assigned uh, to uh, 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 landing craft. Yeah, LSTs? Short, yes. In a short while, we heard they'd been already had Purple Hearts. Oh, wow. And my assignment was to Harvard to go to crypto, get cryptology and become a communications officer. So all kinds of communications I had to study, radio and the flashing light. Now, now did you have any choice in this matter? Uh, no. Okay. No, they didn't give us any choice. They just assigned us. Okay. They, we went where they, they told us. I don't remember any choice. Okay. Uh, I think most people felt they'd like to get out where the action was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so I went up four months up at uh, Harvard in, in the communication school Graduated from that, was sent out to uh, San Diego, and uh, uh, after the, the winter in Boston, I'll tell you, San Diego was a paradise. And uh, so we, I was there for about 10 days on my own, pretty much, until they finally uh, got orders from me to the USS Tacanus Bay, CVE-89. One of those midget carriers. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, it was stationed, its home port was San Diego. I had no idea what I was getting into until I got aboard and uh, found out that it was a training ship for uh, Navy and Marine pilots. Landings. Oh, okay. They did landings with us. And we would uh, leave port. And we would go out for about three or four days, whatever time it took, how much wind we had. <clears throat> and we have a squadron with, that we'd take with us. And they would, uh, each pilot had to make six carrier landings. And then when they, the squadron was finished, they flew, flew ashore. And then we came back. And we, we did it in San Diego and also San Francisco. Once again, uh, going back to this uh, boy from Landlock, Colorado, how was that going to sea? Did you get your sea legs or how was that? Uh... Well, I found out that, you know, uh, if there were very much waves out there, I always got sick. But I always got over it. And that was interesting. But I found out you come in and stay ashore for a few days and go back out, you have to go through the same thing again. So you're always getting sick and getting well. But. Uh, uh, when we were out for any length of time, as we were when we were, uh, after the war, we were uh, sent overseas to uh, bring soldiers back. And I was at sea for any length of time, and I could take anything. Once I got over the initial, right, right. The initial seasickness, I could take anything. So you were the communications officer on the, on the carrier? Uh, well, we were a department. I was a little man on the department well, for a while. Okay. Yeah, for a while. And, uh, I was on, I served, uh, let's see, four months during the war and four months after bringing troops back, we went to Hawaii and to uh, Japan. And then I was four months putting it into mothballs. And then I was, then I was out. And it was pretty well divided that way. And of course, we thought that this war was going to be a long, protracted war, especially going over to Japan. And uh, when that atomic bomb went off, every man cheered, of course. It was great because that was the end of the war for us, and we were very pleased with that. We didn't realize, of course, the implications of nuclear power at that point. Did you have any, any idea when they, they explained what this bomb did? Could you have any concept of what this thing was? Uh, well, we just knew it was, it was a terribly effective, destructive thing. But I don't think we thought much beyond that at the time. It was just... It, it was, uh, it was, it was the finish over. of the war. Right, right, right. And we thought that this war could go on for 10 years. Sure, right. Over. So were you, got, you were in transit to uh, the, 
to Japan at, or where, where were you guys when, when? Well, we were out at sea. We were we were qualifying some uh, Marine squadron okay. at sea. Uh, we were out of uh, San, San Francisco. And uh, when we were at sea when it happened and we knew it was over, so the skipper threw up all our weather balloons and let us shoot. Shoot all the guns at it. We never hit a one. <laughs> so maybe we were in the right duty. But uh, this little this little carrier, I have a picture of it there, is uh, uh, had a wonderful reputation for the number of pilots it uh, qualified for oh, carrier landing. Right, right, right. It had a wonderful. I think we had. Uh, I'm, I'm just guessing at this. It seems to me there were only two deaths in the whole year and a half that operated that way. And uh, of course, we had a lot of crashes. And I used, when I was off duty in the communications office, I used to go up on the, on the island and watch the planes land. And there were, there were quite a few crashes because, uh, you know, they, they were just, the, the hooks didn't catch. Then they'd go into the barrier, and that would stop them. Uh, it could happen, they could jump the barrier if they hit too hard, and they'd go off the front of the ship. I think that only happened very few times. But they could go into the catwalks on either side as well, or into the island. And I, I saw them with all of those things. Mm. Uh, perhaps the one that disturbed me most is when I was working, we had a, a communications office that we had the, the room where all the secret messages were broken down by, by our machines. And there was two of us sitting there, and uh, both we were both uh, what, decrypted messages, secret messages. And this plane hit, and it, uh, it it didn't catch its hook, didn't catch it. Went over and hit the barriers, and then, bang! Right over the top of us. And the, the, the green shade over the light came down on the guy's head, he was wearing it. And boy, we got up and got out of there quickly. Wow. And we got back in there, and here was a propeller blade through the deck. It had to go through steel and, and uh, wood to get in there. That really happens. It was through the deck. Of so your station. office was below the flight deck? Right, right below, right oh. below the flight deck. Oh. So uh, I'll never forget that. Wow. That was, uh, wow. But it was a, a marvelous experience just to watch the, the operations. Oh, that's great, yeah, yeah. It's exciting. Oh, that's so, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. I enjoyed that period of time. What, what was life like on the ship as far as your accommodations and food and, and, and such? Well, uh, let's see. I had a stateroom up forward, and there were four of us in there. And they were nice bunks, and it was good size, so we... Uh, it was it was a popular place for people to to get into. We had a picture there of us celebrating Christmas, I think it was. And uh, of course, you're not allowed to have any alcoholic beverages on the Navy ship. But we had a bottle of whiskey there. Somebody had <laughs> hidden away somewhere, so we we got a picture of that. And uh, uh, I would say the food. Of course, they fed us awfully well. We were into port every. At least every four or five days. Oh, okay. So okay. we had lots of steaks and lots of lots of good things. Uh, and of course, what is stands out now is the place that the the black people were aboard ships, maybe ships. By a long tradition, the all the stewards had to be blacks or Filipinos. Hmm. And so uh, some of them were they were very nice, so um, a little bit surly, you know, because of the things that were written into the regulations for them. Right. They were actually supposed to shine our shoes and do our stuff. If we put them outside the, the door, we never did, you know, but uh, uh, it was a different, they belonged to a different world. They were right. stewards. They right. weren't yeah. anything else. Wow. No other yeah. rates, you know, they wow. were all stewards. So uh, that was part of the time, I guess. Now, you would mentioned you celebrated Christmas one, uh, one or a picture of that. How was it, once again, you grew up with your family and were probably never very, very seldom apart. How, how was that uh, when you went off to the service and through your service? Did, was there any tinge of homesickness, particularly around the holidays? Uh, uh, well, uh, 
I, I don't think I've experienced it very severely because uh, you meet a lot of wonderful men, mm. as we did, and they were great friends and buddies, you know, so you get very close to some of these people. And that must have been another interesting aspect of it, too, meeting uh, people from different parts of the country. Different parts of the country, yeah. yes. And uh, I, I enjoyed those those relationships, and we did a lot of things together, and so, uh, and we were always seeing new things. Everything was mm -hmm. an adventure. Sure. So uh, I guess I didn't get really terribly homesick. I was always glad to go home to visit, and, uh, but it was... Uh, I don't think I visited the whole year I was at sea. Is that right? I don't yeah. think I got yeah. home any of that time, no. But uh, <clears throat> I had earlier when I was going from mm -hmm. one place to the other. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, not when we were assigned to the ship, we didn't ever go home. Okay. So it was finished. So uh, let's continue your story then. Uh, the, the bombs dropped, the, the Japanese surrender. Uh, how soon then did you ship off to? Uh, Japan and well, uh, we stopped operations as far as uh, qualifications of pilots almost immediately, and waited for orders, I suppose. And uh, the orders came very soon that we were to go to Japan or to uh, to Pearl Harbor, and we made oh four or five trips out to Pearl Harbor, picked up uh, military, army people mostly and brought them back. And then we were told, we had several shifts of, of assignments. The first was just to, to go out and do that. Then we became part of what was called the magic carpet. Right, uh -huh. And uh, this took us, the one that took us to Japan, the magic carpet. And on the way to Japan, we were caught in a, what we call a hurricane, but the, the typhoon. Oh, please talk about that. I've heard typhoons. incredible stories about yeah. these, these storms. Well, and our, our ship was not a very big carrier, and of course, you could, you could stand, and when the thing tilted over, you were trying to stand vertical, but you could touch the deck. Yeah. It was just this, this bad, you know, and the spray would come up over, and you, you could, if you were even serving on the island in, in the role of uh, officer of the deck, you get the spray from, from over the front. And of course, uh, our, our, it just so happened that our sides buckled. And uh, we made finished our trip, we got to Tokyo and back, and when we got back, we had to go into Bremerton to get our sides straightened out. Wow. Because wow. it was, it buckled the sides. And, and going out, I remember too, we had, we had to stop several times and uh, check things in the water. We thought they might be floating mines, mm, right. and we would uh, open these fire on some of these. Turns out we never exploded any, so, but it was, uh, it was things that the radar picked up in the water ahead of us, and so we were very careful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, at this point in time, we could turn lights on. Never could do that before. Right, you yeah. know, it was nice. It was fun to have lights to be turned on and so forth. And we had a guy, a seaman of some rate, and he went out to relieve the watch on the on one of the catwalks forward. And I think he jumped, thinking he was jumping into the catwalk, and he must have been beyond it because he jumped right into the water. And so we stopped and uh, turned on all the lights and all our spotlights looking for him. And there were a bunch of, uh, I think there was a destroyer squadron that we knew was in the area. We contacted them and they came and looked and uh, never did find him. Is that right? Yeah. Huh. Never did find him. Poor guy. Huh. And he was a funny guy. I enjoyed him very much. He was the one that used to say, they'd come down on one side or other of, of the center line, and he said, oh, we're using the, the port runway today. <laughs> <laughs> Just to hit, hit that little ship was up, you know, talking about runways. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you made your run to Japan, uh, were you able to get off the ship and, and explore Japan at all? Uh, oh, we did. I was very fortunate there. <clears throat> I had gotten to be friends of the, of the Padre. And uh, so he and I used to, would get off, and, and uh, we went into town. And we went to the, uh, he knew the, the head chaplain of that whole area. Uh, it was an army colonel. And uh, so we went to visit him, and then we went to the building 
uh, our bombs left some of the major administration buildings standing across from the across from the palace. But yeah, please describe what, what you're seeing, what the what, what Tokyo was. Well, the palace was centered, as far as I can remember, uh, uh, where the emperor resided, and there was this major street some distance away. Uh, I don't remember that being on, on the on the rim of the palace grounds. And then they had these enormous buildings, and we were occupying them as the occupying thing. And so we went into them, and uh, uh, the uh, the chapel there put us up for the night, and uh, we had a, a, a fine time there. I remember serving mass for him, and we got to the end of it, and I said, well, I do with the wine, Father. He said, well, all the boys usually do with the wine. I said, okay. So uh, I remember that uh, there. And then we went over to the hotel, uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright famous hotel. It was just a block from there. I forgot the name of it. It's so important, but it was, it's been raised now. It's down, but it was beautiful old hotel in, in Oriental styling. And we visited that. And then we ran into uh, the captain of our ship. He was an Annapolis man. Uh, and he was full captain, of course. And uh, he had means of getting around. Well, he had the ship's uh, jeep, for one thing. Mm -hmm. But he, he asked the padre if he'd like to see the city. And I was the tow along there. I just went with him. So I said, I thought that was wonderful. So he took us all over the bombed out city, oh, wow. showing us. And we saw the people there, and I tell you, you see things that sear your heart because they had nothing. They were. Yeah, I have some pictures here of some of them, but uh, the town was leveled except for particular things, and I credit that to the Norton bomb site a little bit because the bombing was could be very specific, mm -hmm. and uh, large areas were just rubble. But there were uh, school buildings standing, and then the main buildings downtown were standing. So, uh, uh, and they had, they, the Japanese people had, those with shops had opened up to sell to this influx of uh, foreigners, you know. And they were, in the shops, they were smiley and, and, and nice. But outside, they were a little surly, especially the people. And most of the men were still in uniform. They didn't have clothes other than their uniforms. And I have a number of pictures showing that. You know, so, now, you know, for four years, uh, we had been arch enemies, and now we're occupying. How was the interaction? Was there still some animosity on, on, on both sides? Or? Well, you, you felt that from them because, uh, you know, they had nothing. And mm -hmm. here we were. Uh, entertaining ourselves, so to say. So uh, you really felt it on their part. Uh, but you also felt something else. They could be very nice, and uh, you, you could sense that too. But I think we understood the feeling they had. Mm -hmm. they we're now a, a nation who's been vanquished and had nothing, and these poor men had nothing, and no way to get anything. I don't know how they survived, some of them, but uh, so you understood their position pretty much. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, an interesting experience for me to be over in Absolutely. Tokyo Bay. Yeah, yeah. Their old battleship Nagata was sitting in there and we had our battleships and carriers in there, we had everything. The bay was filled with, with the Navy ships. And of course, it's a gorgeous bay with the Mount Fujiyama out there. Oh, the wow. It is, it, it's uh, really something else. So I think I was there probably a week altogether before we could load up. And before we went to, uh, to Tokyo, we went into a shipyard and had bunks put into our hangar deck. And they must have been about five high bunks like this. And so we could we could handle at least well between eight hundred and a thousand. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. What what was the size of the crew of, of your carrier, roughly? Well, that's a good question. 
Uh, I just remember departments. Uh, I don't know what the whole crew was. I have a picture of the whole crew. Uh, just when you mention it, and uh, but I've never counted them. So, uh, well, I, I, we were a pretty good sized crew. Yeah, you know, yeah, floating carriers, cities. Yeah. Carriers, a uh, pretty good sized ship, even those little ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we were a very little carrier compared to the big ones. Sure, right, right. <clears throat> I was on a big one in, in reserve training. So I, I, saw, I saw the difference. <laughs> so take your story then, you, you, uh, part of the magic carpet uh, uh, convoy bringing uh, soldiers back. You just Did you just make the one run to Japan? One run to Japan, that's right. Then we came back and they, uh, they put us in, in uh, Tacoma, Washington, to join the mothball fleet. So we, we, we uh, docked there and started converting all our ship to to the mothball fleet, mm -hmm. shutting down everything. Wow. wow. So I was there for, in Tacoma for about four months and then I got off. So. And, and, and at that point, did you uh, get out of the service or were you still, did you still have no, a commitment? No, I got out of service then. I, I had enough points to get out of service by this time. So <clears throat> I went to Pier, Pier 91 in Seattle and they sent me to San Francisco, and I was discharged from there and given, given a, a ticket, a Pullman ticket, back home. So then I got back home and arrived in Denver at their, the, the depot they still have down there. And I was walking up, they have this big ramp, you walk out when you walk out. And my sister, who was about five years old, came running down the ramp. Oh. With arms open, saying, oh. my time. Oh, wow. So that was a great homecoming. Oh, right? wow. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. I really, really was fortunate. It's the thing is, I've been very fortunate. And I've written about the, the uh, uh, comment on Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, because I said, for those of us who survived it, it's also been the luckiest generation. We are a generation that were welcomed back with open arms, given monies for small business, given monies for uh, education, and uh, we were beneficiaries of the whole technological revolution. Yeah, right. So we have been one of the most fortunate, right, right. And luckiest generations, uh, those of us who survived. Wow, wow. So, so now you're back, you're back in Denver. Uh, how soon then, or where did you did you take some time off, or did you jump back into well, school, or where'd you I go? Going, I came back in uh, June, late June, and uh, I knew I was going to go back into college. I had started at Regis, I thought I'd finish there, and that was somewhere mid September. So I thought, well, I'll just so that'd be September forty six. Forty six. Okay. And I thought I'd just enjoy life. Well, my uncle, he had a ranch up in just out of Laramie. He said, why don't you come up and help me hay? Well, I couldn't say no, so I went up and went from an officer and a gentleman to a, a ranch hand, early in the morning, late at night, cutting hay, stacking it, that kind of stuff, bailing it, so that was my summer. And then I did get back to school, but I had lots of credits by this time because I'd gotten a lot of them the Navy. Yeah, so all the schooling that you, you uh, had gone through around the country, you were able to apply towards uh, your degree? Well, I could apply credit-wise, but I couldn't get a major. I, I had trouble finding a major out of it. So I thought, first of all, I would get an econ major, and that didn't seem to work out. So I found out this was a Catholic college, and it, it had requirements, basic requirements, that... Uh, uh, gave me a lot of credits in philosophy. So I said, well, why don't I just finish it and get get out? So that's what I decided to do. So I finished it in philosophy. Then I went down to get a job in business and found out, well, I didn't have enough business. That's what I really needed. <laughs> and so I said, well, I still got GI Bill. Why don't I just go to graduate school, stay in philosophy, or whatever that will give me. And my dad, who was a banker, he just shook his head, and I was out in left field, which I was. But I, uh, again, it turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life. I got it. 
Uh, after grad, two years of graduate school, I got a job at this small college in northern Wisconsin. And uh, it was pretty hard going for a while because salaries were so terrible. And uh, but as time wore on, it became a great deal. And I was very fortunate there. So I stayed there 40 years. 40 years? 40 years. Is that right? Yeah. And I taught about every subject in philosophy and some in psychology and sociology and general studies and everything else. And I got into administration for a bit and then finally ended up teaching my favorite courses in philosophy to end up. And that was Greek philosophy. So I was, that was my great love, I think. I had taken three years of Greek in college plus five years of Latin, so I had those backgrounds. <clears throat> so I finished up uh, teaching uh, Greek philosophy for the main and until uh, I finally retired. Now did you uh, go on to get your PhD? No, I did everything but, I suppose. I took a lot of courses, but I never, I never got to, into the PhD track. Okay. And uh, fortunately, when I was hired, that wasn't, a I was hired in 1950, so that wasn't, uh, an absolute requirement as it is today. And there were a number of us who were master's degrees who got hired and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, worked out fine for us. And uh, we didn't have the money or the means to sure. get back into graduate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you had mentioned, you, did you, you stay at the Naval Reserves then during this time? I stayed in the Naval Reserve except for the time in graduate school. But as soon as I could, uh, well, I, the Korean War came along. Oh. And I decided, well, I'll stay out. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to go back to sure. work. Sure. So uh, when that was over, then I got back into the reserves and served there for, to complete my, I think I was actually 23 years total. But uh, I uh, finished the requirements for retirement and retired from the reserves. And that in itself is a godsend. Because we still get medical, and uh, you know, and uh, well, it gave me it gave me uh, a day's pay per night. I was there, and I served, and it gave me. Uh, we had a two-week cruise every year, and it gave me full pay for that, and that just was what I needed to make make things go. Yeah. And so that was very good. I I was a commanding officer of two different groups while I was there. And I kept advancing in rank, and so when I retired as lieutenant commander, I, it was a lot more than I ever expected, because I didn't I didn't figure the that their pay scale was tied into uh, uh, so to what to I will say to uh, your retirement. Well, to uh, what are we afraid of? The, we're always afraid of. The price increases as time goes on. What do you call it? Oh, cost of living. Oh, okay. Inflation. Yeah. And I forgot about that, and I forgot about the raises in, in, in cost of living and everything else that went with it. So when I retired, I didn't think I was going to get much at all, but when I actually started getting paid, we had to wait till we were 60 to get paid, uh, it was significant. And it's keep, Wonderful. It keeps growing. Oh, good. So it's good. nice. Good. So all together, then, with your World War II service and reserves, you said you were in 23 years? Yeah, wow. about 23 years. Through the years, have you kept in touch with anybody you served with? Uh, any sort of reunions with, with a carrier? Well, that's an interesting uh, thing from my point of view because <clears throat> when I got aboard this ship, number one, I didn't, I hadn't had shipboard experience. I expected some orientation, which I didn't get. So I had to figure it out for myself. And I made a couple of boo-boos before I could get <laughs> going. And uh, I realized that the people aboard were not too happy with they were serving on this, in this duty. And the reason was they all wanted to be in the front. They all wanted to be where the action was. Mm -hmm. And so they were all, a lot of them were trying to make, uh, uh, to change their assignments. Oh, okay. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this would be just the, the ship's crew people. Um, but, uh, so they weren't uh, a particularly happy group uh, aboard ship. And as a consequence, 
nobody has ever sought to have a reunion. So we've never had a reunion of this ship. And I've looked for them uh, all these years, and there's been no, no one, no movement in that direction. So mm. I think that's probably the reason for it. Right, right, yeah. right, right. How about buddies that uh, you served on board with or went through schooling with? Anybody you've kept in touch? Uh? Well, the people I got, I was closest to, were not assigned with me to the right. ship. So right. I made new new friends aboard ship, and some of them were neat people. But I haven't. We all went back to school, and we all got, just went on to your own. Went on to our own. Right. Uh, right. I don't have any touch with them. I saw one. He was a uh, he was a uh, seaman. I saw him once somewhere, and uh, you know, as a seaman, he had to take orders from us, us young punks. <laughs> and uh, when I saw him later on, he seemed to, uh, he didn't seem as happy as he had <laughs> before. Maybe it was what he was having to do in his work or whatever, I don't know, but uh, there's only one person I encountered huh. that I served with. Huh. Yeah. How about uh, during your time uh, traveling, bounced all over the country and then overseas. Did you ever run into anybody that you knew from home, uh, by chance? Uh, any well, other odd occurrences? Reserves. I did in the reserves, but I don't think I did in the oh, okay. service. Okay. Okay. And I don't remember uh, anybody from the shipment school. Everybody had their own assignments. Yeah. We never met up. So uh, there was a famous Notre Dame football quarterback is in my class there, Jack. I don't forget his name, but mm -hmm. it'll come to me someday. But he was there, that was interesting. Uh, Midshipman School was good. We used the same textbooks as they used at the academy, and it was, uh, it was uh, fast paced and quite thorough, I thought. And uh, we had text and navigation and gunnery. And wow and uh, deck work and all that sort of thing. And uh, so we, I, I remember when we first got there, I had been in the gob uniform until we got into the chimney school. I forgot how to tie a tie. So I had to learn how to retie <laughs> tie a tie and the guy showed me. So that was funny. How, how was that, uh, uh, I guess I forgot to ask that too, the, the transition going from civilian life into military life. Was that much of a transition for you at all? Well, it was a transition because uh, military is so different than anything else. You, know? and you, you, uh, you have to realize, you have to quickly understand uh, who's, who's boss, you yeah. know, and where, where things go and how, how they're done. And your responsibility, of course, they read the <coughs> Navy regs to us every month. I had to listen to all the things you you can or cannot do, and what the penalties are if you do or don't. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a different life, but I, I think it's a good life for a lot of people. I know I've talked over with a friend of mine who was Air Force, and he said, you know, uh, we kind of agreed it would be a good thing in many ways for all young people in the country to have to go into military, to realize that they have to uh, subordinate some of themselves to the, the greater good, mm -hmm. for one thing, and they have to have a, a regimen, they have to have a, uh, it helps them develop a work ethic, and a you know, sense of responsibility, a lot of things that a lot of young kids have to do it the hard way. And right. The military was a shortcut for, for developing maturity for a lot of people, so we agreed that it would be a wonderful thing to for young people to have that experience. And we thought maybe our wives might have had that experience too. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of learning to be self-disciplined. Right, right. You had mentioned uh, uh, a lot of the guys on the ship, the crew, and I don't know, maybe you had the same thoughts too, were itching to get on the, on the uh, to the front and, and in the thick of things. Did you realize, I mean, you realize it now and it's, it's very apparent and, and it, looking back on the, on the facts and figures and, and you realize it now, how important of a role you guys actually played in the war as far as training these pilots. Did you realize that then? I think that if you had talked to them and, and to point that out to them, they would say, well, yes, I know it's important and it's, it's a good thing to do. 
but uh, let somebody else do it. <laughs> that was their <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I've done enough. Yeah. Let somebody else do it. They just didn't want to be stuck with doing it. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. But I think they realized, and we had an enviable uh, record on carrier landings. Right. Thank goodness. Yeah. Uh, we. Uh, we trained a lot of pilots. Right, right, exactly. Often went over and went out to in the far Pacific. But here we were, you know, out four or five days, in for three or four, and in San Diego or San Francisco. I had a girlfriend in San Francisco, and it was quite nice, you know, to, to look forward to meeting her. And of course, you had the advantages of the officers' clubs in those days in San Diego. I forgot the little island in San Diego. I was going to look that up. There's a little island that, uh, well, it's almost on the tip of my tongue. But that's where the officers' quarters were. It was a, kind of like a South Sea island. It was oh, is that right? What? Swimming and sand and officers' clubs. And, you know, you had pools and, and places to eat. and. Uh, was wonderful. And up at Alameda, Air, Air Force Base in, in San Francisco. Again, it was a very nice place. So when you had time, you could go over to the officer's club and just relax and swim and enjoy yourself. It was, it was very nice. Oh, and, oh yeah. great. Of course, we were fortunate. I think being officers yeah. was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they treated pretty well, the military. So. Well, let's talk uh, a little post-war. You, you talked about your, your uh, college career. Uh, talk about uh, family, how you met your wife and her name and how long you've been married and, and the kids and grandchildren, great-grandchildren. This was an interesting way, too. Uh, I, uh, when we, the vets came back to college, there were a small group of people there who had run things. And we came back and we said, no, we're back. So, and we were back in numbers. So I was elected as a student body president. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, there was this women's college south of town that had been a very, uh, kind of a finishing school, so we thought. And we had labeled it Goon Hill because uh, when, when a woman went out to, into town, she had to have dress hose, high heels, hat, and gloves before she could leave campus. And they had their tea dances, and we'd go to the tea dances, and the nuns would be standing around, you know, watching, interested in all this sort of thing. And uh, they were very nice, but very, what did I say, sedate? Uh, anyway, so a lot of our guys would go to the nursing homes for their dates. And uh, when we came back from the war, we decided, you know, these two schools, both of the same religion and so forth should get together. So our committee got that got that idea going. I think I may have started it. So it Regis was an all male school. All male. <laughs> okay. So Red Heights was an all female. <clears throat> so I called out there and told them we'd like to speak of ways of getting together. And so uh, we went out there and, and had a committee meeting and sat down with these young ladies and. Uh, at a meeting, and everybody seemed to think it was a great idea. It so happened the, uh, the president of their student body, who conducted the meeting, I thought we needed to have some follow-up with so I asked her out for a date. <laughs> and uh, that worked very nicely. And then we had a, another woman there, and my best friend back at Regis, I said, well, this, she's a pretty gal, when, when will I get a date for you? So he, he and she came. And we had both been officers, so we went down to the Cosmopolitan Hotel, which is no longer in existence, to their officers' clubs, which were still going. Huh. So, uh, see, our, our, uh, our proposal was that we get together for arts and sciences and other kinds of things. So here we were, we were engaging in music, albeit jazz. <laughs> music and dancing and so forth. We thought, well, that's, that's what we're after, isn't it? So we had our meetings down there. And uh, it was quite nice. And we had to have them back by midnight. Of course, we were, we respected that completely. 
But after about uh, well, three or four meetings, the dean out there was a savvy old gal. She, she said, here are the keys to the dorm, so you don't have to wake me up. So when you come back, you can get in on your own. So the girls had the keys of the dorm. And we thought that was unusual. And it was, but both couples got married later on. So Is that right? She had her, she had her agenda going. The, the oldest <laughs> nun out there, we met her many years later. And she used to smile, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so we and a number of others on the committee intermarried huh. as a result of this. So that's how my wife and I got together. And she was a girl from Craig, Colorado. And uh, college was the greatest thing in the world for her. And she, uh, she did well there. And uh, so we got married in downtown Denver, Holy Ghost Church. And then we headed back to St. Louis for graduate school. Rather naive and rather, uh, you know, unprepared to meet the demands of the world, but we, things just worked out for us. I'll be done. We were there for a couple of years, and uh, I had to work there too in order to pay for, well, we had a child coming on the way very soon, a year after, well, yeah, just about a year after we were married. How many years have you been married now? Uh, Sixty. Two, is it? Wow. Wait a minute. 4862 this year. Wow. Yeah. So uh, we had a big celebration on our 60th. Now we're going to call off celebration, but we've had enough celebration. But <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we went back to, to uh, St. Louis for two years, and then I went up to Green Bay. I'll be darned. So, married 62 years, five children, uh, five children. how many grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Ten grandchildren, and no great-grandchildren yet, yeah. but we have, oh, we're getting a, grand, a granddaughter, our oldest granddaughter is married July 3rd, so this is the big plans right now, so hopefully. We'll have a great grandchild before we leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Tom, we'll start to wind down this interview. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about, or anything that's surface come to the surface as we've been talking that you want to talk about, so that hopefully we've rounded out your story as best we could? I think the active duty years have pretty much been taken care of. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the more interesting, actually interesting things are what happened when I was in the reserves. Oh, is that right? Well, going please, on cruise. Yeah, please talk well, about some of those. Yeah. For one, I got on the flight, uh, I had a two week duty on the flagship of the Second Fleet, the Northampton. And uh, we went out on it for, for maneuvers because the United States was in charge of the NATO exercises that year. And the Secretary of Navy brought a lot of guests. So there were a lot of guests and senior reserve officers. And uh, we went out with the whole fleet. Wow. They were all out there in the Atlantic. And the atomic submarines put on a show for us. And they would dive under us and come up on the other side. And it was a fabulous experience from that point of view. Uh, another one, I was on a, the Tarawa, a, a Essex carrier. And it was a, a contrast with what I had experienced, because when we went to sea, we had to have our whole 18 knots going and a wind coming over the deck before we could launch aircraft. Well, on the Tarawa, it was the, the jet age, and we came in from exercises after a week and anchored, this was at Newport, Rhode Island, we anchored. And then they shot off their planes. I thought, my God, that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> they shot off their jets, you know, with the, with the uh, catapult. catapults and sent them, sent them ashore. I thought, wow. In fact, that was the experience. I was assigned to the communications department, and everything had changed by this time. It was all teletype, you know, and I knew nothing about that. And so uh, it wasn't long thereafter that they transferred me out of communications into Personnel. <laughs> Personnel work. But uh, 
I had an exciting trip too. Uh, we had a squadron and trip on the Great Lakes. And the squadron was doing exercises as squadron, which wasn't always the case. And we had a, a, a destroyer escort, DE, who was the flagship. And we had a reserve commodore aboard. And we were going through the St. Clair River from Huron to, to Erie. From here? Yeah, Huron to Erie. And uh, this big Ford tanker wanted to pass us all. We were going to speed limit, but he didn't pay any attention to speed limits. And uh, so we said, okay. And so he was passing, it was a f we were six ships, I think, five or six, six, I think. And he was passing us, and he passed two without problems. And on the third one, as he was passing, he drew the bow of the third one into his, into his fantail. Oh my. And they collided and hooked together. Well, that gave him an enormous rudder. So all he did is move in and, and uh, he uh, ran into the bank. Fortunately, it was a, a place where there were houses or buildings. And he just ran into the bank. And they disconnected. When he hit the bank, I guess they disconnected. So ours backed off. This was a piece, PCE. Maybe PC. He backed off, and the Ford tanker backed off, and finally got on course again and kept going. Well, of course, it's an accident, and we had to investigate. Well, I had been in the wardroom reading Brothers Karamazov, and the commander came through there, saw me, he says, Valen, you are the head of the, t the Board of Inquiry. So I had another officer there, and we had to interview everybody, both, all ships. We couldn't get the Ford ship, it's gone. But the, the young man on the PCE who was captain was an Annapolis graduate. So I assume it could have been his career. You know. So we investigated everything. We got all our charts out, all our, our logs out, and, and uh, looked at every one of them and wrote up a report and uh, sent it into Great Lakes. And I think it exonerated the man very much because Sometimes you get a, a propeller effect or uh, uh, we'll do this and we'll draw one thing into another. And uh, of course, the Ford thing was going too fast. It was passing with no passing zone and so forth. And so, uh, you know, that exonerated all yeah, people yeah, pretty well. Yeah. And, uh, but it was, uh, it was an experience I remember well, except I, I don't remember having any weekend liberty. <laughs> I don't think I, I took one. I had to get this all prepared and ready for, for when we, we finished our cruise. So that was interesting. And then I took another one down in uh, uh, Long Beach. Long Beach. And uh, we couldn't get on this cruiser we were supposed to get on, so they sent our, uh, all the people in the reserves over to the mine squadron. Uh, and uh, those are ships that are so interesting in themselves. They have no metallic, nothing metallic, or nothing magnetic on them. And uh, so they're wooden hulls, and they have, uh, the metals are, are not, uh, none of them are metallic. So they're very interesting things. Mm. And uh, so I got attached to that, but I was senior to all the skippers. So they put me aboard, uh, ashore to the uh, executive officers. And he said to me, uh, are you cleared for secret? I said, yes. He said, all right, you sit down next to my desk, and I'll pass everything I do through you so you get some idea of what goes on here. And the, and the radio room was right across the hall, so I could keep track of that. So uh, turns out the executive officer was also the, the commanding officer of divers. He was an old hard hat diver. And the Mustang came up through the ranks and then became an officer. He was a, I think, a lieutenant commander at the time, or commander. And uh, so uh, the stuff coming in that was fantastic, because he had to go, he had to go, it was like Lloyd Bridges in that famous, uh, if you remember that, it was in Florida, though. He was the same equivalent out here. He used to investigate all these ships that uh, were stranded out there. He had to go down to uh, Mexican coast because a torpedo ended up on the, on the coast, uh, a stray torpedo. 
uh, he had, uh, well, we had in the time we're in, in, in duty there, he had a ship come in with his screws all entangled in steel, a steel cable, and we had to send divers down to free that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was very, very, his stories were interesting. Yeah. And I could, uh, I could, uh, but he had to make all the inspections of these ships. So they line up the docks out there. There could be half a dozen. He'd take maybe one a day, though. And I had to go with him. So we'd go with him and we'd inspect each ship. Well, one ship, they're all good. But they, they're configured a little different sometimes when they're, when they're finished off. And so this one just really impressed me. And I said, you know, I, I'd like to bring my wife down here to see your ship. He says, do it. He says, as a matter of fact, I'll invite my wife and we'll have lunch. <laughs> so, uh, that's what happened. We had lunch there, and he showed my wife the whole whole ship, and uh, that was one of my more interesting. Oh ones. wow! Uh. So I had some very interesting. To say the Absolutely. Way. Now, was there any worry during your naval or your reserve career of being pulled into the Vietnam War at all? Were you? No, uh, and I don't know. What years were the Vietnam War? Roughly, I don't know, 65 to 74? So you had to been out. Oh, wait, oh, okay, oh, okay, oh, okay, okay. So right. it was too late for me. Okay. Yeah, otherwise I could have been. Right, right. Yeah, but for personnel work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, we'll, we'll wind this down. Uh, the one question I always like to ask towards the end of the interview is, how do you think your wartime experience uh, particularly during World War II, uh, played a role in your life, affected your life, changed your life at all, or, or was it just simply a chapter of your life you went through? How would you answer that? Well, uh, I think it got me started thinking about more important things in life, and I think it was responsible in some measure for my deciding to go and get a philosophy. Degree. Oh, really? Yeah. So I think it had, to, it had a bearing that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, a lot of young people are really lost as far as where they're going and what they're going to do. And this sort of provided some direction for me and decided where I wanted to go and what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a teacher, I thought. So that's what I did for yeah. 40 years. I'll be done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today. Mm -hmm. uh, more importantly, though, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you very much, Brad. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, this is December 14th, my graduation date from Midshipman School at Columbia University in New York City. Yeah, this is my gob uniform when I first entered the service and learned how to button the 13 buttons in front. <laughs> Here we are in New York City, in Greenwich Village actually, a friend's house, in my midshipman uniform. And finally I've become an officer and a gentleman. <laughs> yeah, this is what often happened in our training exercises. A plane would miss, its tail hook would miss the cable and it would come and crash on the barriers and of course it always nosed over and the propellers would dig into the deck. We were fortunate if they missed the island or didn't go off the front, uh, the bow of the ship or into any of the catwalks on the sides. But you said this is the, uh, one of the similar instances where the uh, propeller went through the roof and into your office? Our office was just a little just below there. Yeah. We were visiting Japan to pick up troops and return them home in December 1945. And we noticed, among other things, a lot of the men were in uniform. And you see the, key, the case here uh, of a man in uniform. And, not looking too happy. Yeah. And you said simply, they had their uniform simply because they had no other clothes. They right? had no other clothes yeah. to wear. And here's a group of Japanese soldiers. They have no place to sit, probably no place to live, 
They're in their uniforms because they have no clothes. And I don't know how they survived. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a metal case. Uh, it's a case that shows uh, not too much in terms of battles or such, but it represents what experiences I had, and I'm proud of it. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Yes, this is the ship done by an artist aboard ship and put into our commissioning uh, folder. Uh, it's a, the only thing like it that I have. I have smaller ones from the Navy, but this is the, an artist's production.